Dear Professor Heschel, dear colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to welcome all of you most warmly to the 10th annual Martin Buber Lecture in Modern Jewish Intellectual History and Jewish Thought at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. My name is Christian Wiese. I hold the Martin Buber Chair in Modern Jewish Philosophy at Goethe University, and I'm delighted that you followed our invitation to this webinar and that despite or maybe because of the pandemic, we do have a wonderful international audience and will be able to discuss the topic of this lecture in a constellation that we never had before. Uh, instead of sitting in a casino building on West End campus in Frankfurt, followed by a reception, this time we, we will have a truly global audience with students and colleagues from a number of countries who are participating from their homes and others who might be watching the live streaming from several places in the world. I'm particularly honored and delighted to welcome our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Susanna Heschel, who will be speaking from her home in Boston. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for offering to speak about a topic that could not be more relevant given the social and political challenges we are all facing, not merely in the United States, but globally, globally, with racism and its consequences being one of the most ardent problems of our time. I know you would rather be in Frankfurt in person and meet your audience, and so would we. All the more, I'm very grateful to you that you are joining us this way. We are excited about the opportunity to listen to you and to uh, enter into a dialogue with you after your lecture. Thank you. The event is co-organized by the Martin Buber Chair in Jewish Thought and Philosophy at Goethe University in Frankfurt in cooperation with the Institute of English and American Studies, uh, also at Goethe University, represented by Professor Johannes Völz and the Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften in Bad Homburg, the Institute for Advanced Studies of our university, represented by its director, Professor Matthias Lutz-Bachmann. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to both of them for their role in co-organizing and planning this webinar. I would also like to introduce and uh, thank my colleague, Dr. Stefan Vogt, who will also play an important role after uh, the lecture in organizing and moderating the discussion after Susanna uh, will have ended. We, we have about 30 to 45 minutes for questions and answers after the lecture. And our suggestion would be uh, that those in the audience who would like to pose a question or give comments may indicate that in the chat. And Stefan Vogt will then constantly observe the chat and will call your names and ask you to pose your questions. The discussion we think should be held in English, but if there's for any reason somebody who would like to pose a question in German, Susanna uh, Herschel can certainly respond in English to a German question. And even in German, I know that. So before I say a few words about the tradition of the Buber lectures and introduce our speaker, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Lutz Bachmann, who is also delighted to welcome the audience. Thank you, Christian. Let me welcome you all, wherever you are, we are really honored that you are participants tonight to this wonderful uh, Martin Buber lecture. Uh, very warm welcome to Susanna Heschel, the speaker of uh, this evening. Uh, the Goethe University as a whole is honored by your presence um, in this Martin Buber lecture. Uh, let me uh, express the gratitude of our president, Professor Wolf, who is not able to attend this event, but she asked me to express her greetings to this audience. The Martin Buber lecture is one of the most important academic events on our campus and now in a national online um, discussion um, seminar. I'm very happy that we have this Martin Buber lecture uh, organized uh, by Christian Wiese and there for Jewish thought and philosophy. Besides that, 
Christian is one of the directors of the Fortune Tribune Kommandwissenschaften, and we are the co-organizers for this lecture. And I'm very proud to announce that in this uh, community of uh, very distinct professors and experts, we could organize uh, a group of researchers uh, doing research in the field of religious dynamics. And um, the Martin Buber lecture is one of the pillars of this research group. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Christian to continue. Thank you very much for your words of welcome. And I just want to say a few words about the tradition of the Buber lectures before I introduce Susanna Heschel. The name of Martin Buber lends itself, of course, perfectly for a diversity of relevant themes um, in, in these Buber lectures. Uh, it is a tradition that has been created 10 years ago. Um, and the work of Martin Buber and his philosophical and political thinking in the 20th century cover an impressively broad range of aspects which are relevant for Jewish thought and much beyond the field of Jewish studies for religious, historical, philosophical, and political thinking in general until this very day. This includes Buber's studies on the biblical tradition and the Jewish and non-Jewish mysticism, his remarkable reflect reflections on building and education, his groundbreaking thoughts on the nature of dialogical thinking, his influential vision of Jewish-Christian dialogue within the context of a pluralist society, but also his views on the nature of Jewish nationalism and Jewish Arab relations, his ethical interpretations of the biblical and Hasidic traditions, and many others. Martin Buber's name is at the same time linked indissolubly to the history of Frankfurt, where he taught at the Freie Jüdische Lehrhaus during the Weimar Republic and the Nazi period, as well as to the history of the Goethe University. During his years as a lecturer since 1924 and as an honorary professor of Jewish religion and ethics between 1930 and 1933, Buber contributed to the establishment of religious studies at the newly founded university and experienced almost a decade of productive teaching and writing. Buber's resignation from his professorship in 1933 and his forced emigration to Palestine in 1938 are symbolic of the terrible loss the University of Frankfurt suffered by the exclusion and persecution of the many Jewish scholars who had shaped its development uh, before the Nazi period. To me, the fact that the professorship in Jewish thought and philosophy was created more than 30 years ago in memory of Buber's role at the University of Frankfurt and that the Martin Buber chair is devoted to interdisciplinary research and teaching is in many respects an obligation. And one aspect of this obligation is to address the broad range of religious, social and political questions associated with Buber's thought, but also with the modern Jewish tradition, religious and secular, and the Jewish experience in general. An obligation, I think, to provide a forum for the open and critical discussion of the major issues that are relevant for contemporary society. Almost none of the previous Buber lectures has been devoted to Martin Buber himself, and this is not what they are about. Many of the lectures address questions regarding contemporary society and politics, which is more than appropriate, given the fact that Buber was an eminent political thinker, a thinker who devoted his philosophical uh, he, he devoted his philosophy to vital questions of anthropology and social sciences, to the burning political issues of his own time in Europe and the Middle East, many of whom are also troubling us today. And even the other dimensions of Buber's work, his dialogism, his reading of the Bible, his challenges to Christianity, and his interpretation of Hasidism are permeated with eminently political aspects. His thoughts on nationalism within the context of an unprecedented war in Europe and the Nazi genocide were not confined to the academic realm, but implied clear concepts for the political reality post-1945 in Europe, in Palestine. His thoughts on the belief of the prophets 
published during World War II, had strong implications for his understanding of uh, the dramatic political context in which he was writing. Abraham Joshua Heschel, Susanna Heschel's father, briefly served as Buber's successor at the Frankfurt Lehrhaus in 1938, before he himself was expelled from Germany and later had to flee from Poland to England and from there to the United States. And it is here in Frankfurt, Susanna, that I met you in 1992 and 1993 uh, when, you, uh, gave, uh, when you gave courses uh, as the then Buber visiting professor uh, at the Goethe University. And uh, you have been returning here several times and it gives me great pleasure to welcome and briefly introduce you uh, to our audience now. Susanna Heschel is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. She received her doctorate uh, from the University of Pennsylvania in 1989. She served as lecturer, assistant professor of religious studies at Southern Methodist University uh, from 1988 to 1991, and later as Abba Hillel Silver, uh, professor of Jewish studies at Case Western Reserve University until 1998. Uh, Susanna has been a visiting professor not only in Frankfurt, but also in Cape Town, in Edinburgh, in Princeton, and other places. And she is the recipient of numerous very prestigious grants, including from the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation. She had a year-long Rockefeller Fellowship at the National Humanities Center. She held a fellowship in Germany, the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, uh, I think in 2011-12, um, and received several honorary doctorates, one also in Germany, um, but also from, United, uh, from universities in the United States, in Canada, among others. Um, in 2015, she was elected a member of the American Society for the Study of Religion, and she frequently lectures in Germany and serves also on the Academic Advisory Board of the Selma Stern Centrum for Jewish Studies in Berlin. Susanna Heschel's scholarship focuses on Jewish-Christian relations in Germany during the 19th and 20th centuries, on the history of biblical scholarship, the history of anti-Semitism, but also the history of European Jewish scholarship on Islam. Her numerous pub publications as a historian and public intellectual include a number of inspiring books, for example, her monograph, Abraham Geiger and the Jewish Jesus, 1998, which received the Abraham Geiger Prize of the Geiger Colleague in Germany and the National Jewish Book Award. And uh, I had a great pleasure of translating this book uh, into German many years ago. She has also written the challenging book, which hasn't been translated, unfortunately, The Aryan Jesus, Christian Theologians and the Bible in Nazi Germany and uh, edited a number of volumes, co-edited with other scholars, but I want to emphasize her, uh, her edition of essays of her father, the grandeur and spiritual audacity essays of Abraham Joshua Heschel. She also recently published in 2018, a German book entitled Jüdische Islam, Islam und Jüdische, Jüdisch-Deutsche Selbstbestimmung. Now, the title of Susanna Heschel's lecture tonight is Racism in America, the Past and Future of Black Jewish Relations. And before she starts uh, with the lecture itself, please let me play a short introductory three or four minute film clip related to the civil rights movement in the United States and Jewish involvement in it. It stems from a brand new documentary produced by Dr. Sherry Rogers entitled Shared Legacies, the African-American Jewish Civil Rights Alliance, which has currently been shown at several Jewish film festivals in the United States and will soon be available uh, worldwide. And I would like to thank here Dr. Rogers for allowing us to show this short clip. There's an African proverb that says if the uh, lions don't tell their stories, the hunters will get all the credit. I'm telling you the story now because you're young lions and lionesses. My great-grandfather had been in slavery and it 
goes across generations. You just don't get rid of it simply because there are no chains on you. The effects of slavery are still very prominent, just as the effects of the Holocaust are still very prominent amongst our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. My father came from Warsaw, Poland. He was born into a very religious family. He went to Germany. He was there from 1927 until 1938. He lost his mother, he lost three of his sisters in the Nazi period, and then he came to America. The Jewish people have the DNA in their soul to look up close to what happened to African Americans after slavery. We came to the South, young Jews, rabbis, many of them refugees from Nazi Germany. We hear Dr. King quoting the prophets. Our Bible, all of a sudden, was lifted up again. We as Jews owe you a great debt of gratitude. You helped restore us. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, the future of America will depend on how it responds to Dr. King. It was the work that Dr. King had spoken for. You know, fairness, equality against anti-Semitism and support of freedom for Soviet Jews. A large Jewish presence in the civil rights movement was evident almost from the beginning. Well, Stan Levinson and Harry Wachtell were lawyers who were working with Dr. King. They were advisors, marchers, fundraisers. They were in the thick of things. Many Jewish students worked all across the South. And I will never, ever forget three young men, Andy Goodman, Micka Scherner, and James Shaney. Birmingham is bombing him. We all know the Exodus is the central narrative of our redemption. And here is a modern situation. Shall we do nothing? We could not have gotten anywhere had not Protestants, Catholics, and Jews showed up from all over the world. Rabbi Yakum Prince spoke immediately before Dr. King. The most shameful and the most tragic problem is silence. The civil rights challenges of our time, the human rights challenges of our day, they hang on me, they hang on you, they hang on who? They hang on us! When my father came back from Selma, he wrote in his diary, for many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about prayer and protest. Legs are not lips, and walking is not kneeling. And yet, our legs uttered songs. Even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. We all need to get together to find out the bigger picture. Those who have been stepped upon have to lead the way. It's all about our humanity. And if we don't figure out a way truly to work together, will just be like hamsters on a wheel. The systemic oppression and issues will just continue. There are too many people living in fear. If Rabbi Hersher and Wonders King Jr. were here today, I think they would be saying, we need to pull together for generation yet unborn. The soul of America is at stake. Susanna, it is now your turn. Thank you so much, Christian Visa, for inviting me to give this lecture and for our wonderful friendship for so many years. I, I also want to thank Dr. Folk for being here. Uh, Dr. Matias, whose last name is, I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce, but I, I look forward to your comments at the end as well. And I want to express my deep gratitude to Dr. Sherry Rogers for having made this film. As you can see, many of the people that she interviews are unfortunately no longer with us. So the film has great historic importance to all of us. And it's, I have to say, deeply moving. So I thank Dr. Rogers for giving us permission to look at that film and to show us especially those extraordinary images from the march in Selma, Alabama, 1965. 
Now, I'm going to speak somewhat historically today. And the question that I want to ask myself about the civil rights movement and Jewish involvement in it is why the civil rights movement was and remains so important to American Jews. We know the Jews were disproportionately involved at nearly every level of the civil rights movement and that heritage of Jewish involvement has given Jews a profound sense of pride and in many ways also transformed Judaism as a theology and also as a religious practice. That photograph of my father, and you just saw a bit of it in the film, the photograph of my father with Martin Luther King and Selma has become iconic. It's been reproduced in Jewish history textbooks, books on American Jews, uh, books, on, uh, books on Christian Jewish relations and black Jewish relations. It's perhaps become one of the most famous photographs for Jews. And certainly my father's own relationship with Dr. King has inspired many of us, black and white, Jews and Christians, and it's a relationship that continues to be marked by awards and honors to this day. Now, I wanna begin with the question, first of all, why do we talk about blacks and Jews? First of all, it erases the existence of black Jews and makes an assumption that Jews are white. Why would Jews think of themselves as white? Certainly many are, but many are not. Some have estimated that more than 10% of the American Jewish community is black, black Jews. And the figures are much higher in the state of Israel. And of course, even higher for Jewish communities in Ethiopia, Uganda, and elsewhere in Africa. But it also raises the question of what is whiteness? Whiteness is in part a product of historical consciousness. Despite antisemitism, marginalization from Christian society and longstanding denigrations of Judaism in Christian Europe, denigrations also of the Jewish body, associations that were not well intended, associations of Jews with black and blackness, Jews in Europe nonetheless thought of themselves as white. Jewish self-understanding as white was also reinforced by their own slave owning, but also by Jews ignoring the existence of slave trade. So for instance, I ask myself often, why is it there's so many books on the philosopher Spinoza and they place him in the setting of Amsterdam, but they never mentioned that Amsterdam in the 17th century was a slave trading city. How would that have affected him to live in a city and in a culture where slave trading was going on? And so in other words, it's ignored just as our Jewish texts rarely mention Jewish slave owning in Brazil, in the Caribbean, this notion that Jews are white is reinforced by the Jews' arrival in the antebellum United States in the 19th century, when Jews loved to declare that they had left behind the Egypt of Europe to arrive in America, America that they called the promised land, despite its slave plantations. Even more important is the Jewish slave owning is omitted from works of scholarship that deal with Jews in Muslim realms. In the Mediterranean basin, for example, the book, multi-volume book by Shlomo Dov Goytain doesn't mention the Jews also owned slaves there. Few of us know that there was a Hebrew blessing recited upon the purchase of a slave. So as a result of the omission, Jews have been able to construct a historical consciousness in which they're innocent of the worst manifestations of racism. And this is what I would call a Judeo innocence that was reinforced as the Jewish community in the United States immersed itself in slavery, lynching, segregation, and racial tensions. Racism, of course, was not a Jewish creation, and there were very few Jews who owned slaves in the United States. In fact, I would say that this Judeo innocence had a counterpart in an American innocence regarding the Jews, a notion that Americans had not put Jews through a long drawn out emancipation process as had happened in Europe, but rather gave Jews citizenship immediately upon arrival, which means the conclusion is drawn that America can possibly be anti-Semitic. America is a land of opportunity, of freedom, and this is the American anti-Semitism conundrum 
that it has never been as bad in America as it was in Europe, or that Americans are too distracted by their racism toward black people to have time to hate Jews, who are of course presumed to be white, or even that the Old Testament traditions that are important in the Calvinism that shaped America show that America has a philo-Semitic background and protects Jews from Christian theological anti-Judaism. All of this is meant to indicate that America is a post-anti-Semitic society, which is in fact just as problematic as the alleged post-racial society that we are supposed to have become with the election of President Barack Obama. What is post-racial? Post-racialism, articulated so well by David Theo Goldberg, argues that racism is reinforced by its very denial. For instance, we look back at the Senator Moynihan report that blamed women for poverty in black families, denying the existence of racism as the factor. Or we listen to police officers, the one in North Carolina who claimed that he felt threatened and therefore fired his weapon. Even though we later saw a video of the incident that showed the victim unarmed and running away before he was killed. And then saw the officer, the police officer place his own weapon next to the victim to fabricate a threat. Or we think about Congressman Steve King who insisted that the death of Eric Garner strangled to death by police officers in New York surrounded by other police officers who didn't interfere, that Eric Garner's death was caused by his obesity and asthma. The idea of biological race in short is the ever ready, not guilty plea of structural racism that's concealed as post-racialism. Now in their views, about slavery and in their treatment of slaves, Jews in the antebellum United States were largely indistinguishable from their Christian neighbors. The important distinction is that while some 19th century rabbis claimed that slavery did not violate the Hebrew Bible, rabbis in the 1960s did not try to develop religious justifications for forced segregation as their counterparts in the Christian community did. Now, when my father first became involved in the civil rights movement in 1963, there were of course other rabbis and young Jews already taking part. And yet he was criticized because American Jews were in fact divided over the goals and the methods of the civil rights movement. There were some Jews who felt the Jewish involvement in civil rights would endanger Jews, especially those in the South and it would undermine Jewish efforts to gain access to the upper echelons of American society, especially as affirmative action began to emerge as a principle in the late 1960s. Moreover, there was an old tradition of Jewish politics that's called shah, still, be quiet, don't speak out loud. Problems should be addressed behind the scenes, not in public to be outspoken, but only incite anti-Semitism. And this of course is the kind of political tradition attacked by Zionists and by Jewish thinkers such as Hannah Arendt. And it began slowly eroding in American Jewish life in the 19th century, but it continues to have a remnant, especially when Jews want to take a moral stance on a political issue that does not directly affect Jews and the Jewish community. On the national level, Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement focused first of all on funding, schools that were established for black children by Julius Rosenwald, the funding for the NAACP, for the SCLC and so forth. There were prominent Jewish lawyers who were at the forefront of many cases that received national attention from defending the Scottsboro boys to the Brown versus Board of Education case and the integration of the University of Mississippi and many more. There were national Jewish organizations like the National Conference of Jewish Women, the American Jewish Conference, Congress, and of course, rabbis who were active stirring up their congregations and some who went south to become freedom riders. 
On some issues, Jewish organizations also came too late and failed to understand all of the issues at stake. So for example, Mark Dolinger writes about the American Jewish Congress's support for anti-lynching legislation in the 1950s. But lynching by then had pretty much ended. It ended in part because the Ku Klux Klan and the police had in some sense taken over its role of intimidation and fear using fire hoses, trained dogs, batons, imprisonment, and various forms of intimidation as well as murder of African-Americans and also of white people, including Jews who got involved in the civil rights movement, simply trying to help African-Americans claim the inalienable rights of democracy, of schooling, of voting, of freedom from fear, something that has not yet been achieved. In the North, civil rights support from Jews was generational and also class-based. In general, wealthier Jews in the North gave support to the civil rights movement, while working class Jews tended to oppose the integration efforts of the movement, even while their own college-aged children were going South to protest. There is a sense, of course, of pride and heroism in how Jews regard their role in the civil rights movement. But racism at the time was viewed in the North as primarily a Southern issue. Support for Dr. King did not always translate to much Jewish effort at integrating neighborhoods and schools in cities such as Boston and Chicago, where many Jews abandoned integrated urban areas for white suburbs. And the consequences of that, by the way, for schooling and many other uh, issues in American life were enormous. Jews opposed, that is, the legalized segregation in the South, but at the same time opposed desegregation efforts in the North. Not all, but that was prevalent. Still, we have to recall Jewish students comprised roughly two thirds of all the white freedom riders in the summer of 1961 and more than a third of the volunteers for the 1964 Mississippi voter registration campaign. Northern Jewish representation in the struggle became so strong that there's a historian who's referred to this era as the quote, Jewish phase of the civil rights revolution. In the South, Jews were found at both ends of the political spectrum. In Selma, Alabama, for example, Saul Tepper owned a big department store, Jewish, and was a member of the White Citizens Council, which was a network of white segregationists with an agenda similar to the Ku Klux Klan, but open and not secretive. By contrast, Muriel Lewis, also in Selma, was a staunch supporter of civil rights. There were some rabbis in the South who were outspoken from the pulpit in support of civil rights, and then some who were silent. But sometimes it's hard to interpret, and from whose perspective, what exactly was going on. So I'll give you an example. Rabbi Milton Grafman in Birmingham, Alabama, was viewed by the white community as a figure at the forefront of the civil rights movement in that city of Birmingham, sometimes called Birmingham. And yet Rabbi Grafman signed the famous appeal of white local clergy asking Dr. King, who was in jail at the time in Birmingham, to moderate, to slow down, which is what prompted Dr. King to write his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. So was he at the forefront? Rabbi Seymour Atlas in Montgomery, Alabama, was the rabbi of a small synagogue that was just down the road from Dr. Martin Luther King's church at the time in Montgomery in the 50s. And Dr. King told Rabbi Atlas that he would like to study Hebrew with him. And Rabbi Atlas was delighted. He writes about it in his memoir. And then members of the congregation told Rabbi Atlas that if Dr. King came to the synagogue to see him, he should come in through the back door, the service entry, and not enter the synagogue through the front door. Rabbi Atlas was so fed up that he quit went north. Many rabbis moderated their voices, especially in small towns in the south where Jews were very small in number in a tiny community in a rural area. 
Moses Landau, the spiritual leader of the Jews in Cleveland, Mississippi, claimed, quote, that the Jewish community could not exist if they were in any way involved in the civil rights movement. Whether or not the rabbi spoke out for or against segregation, Southern synagogues were attacked starting in the 1950s. And those attacks accounted for 10% of all the bombings in the South during the civil rights era. The violence was intimidating and so were the economic boycotts of Jewish owned stores. On the 16th of March, 1958 in Miami, Florida, Bethel congregation had a bomb explode and the congregation's rabbi, Abraham Levitin, received threats not to preach about integration. Rabbi Jacob Rothschild of Atlanta, Georgia, acknowledged that a bombing of his synagogue in October of 1958 had occurred in part because, as he said, I was so obviously identified with the civil rights movement, which he was. So synagogues came to represent the symbols of the Jewish voices of the South who were supporting, uh, supporting the civil rights movement or simply as a warning not to get involved. Tensions, tensions between Jews of the North and the South peaked in the summer of 1961 as dozens of Northern Jewish volunteers traveled to Mississippi. They traveled there as part of freedom rides uh, held to demonstrate that the Supreme Court orders, the orders to desegregate interstate buses were being flouted. As they traveled, they were beaten viciously at bus stops throughout the South, beaten by white mobs, sometimes by the Ku Klux Klan. These people used baseball bats, iron pipes, bicycle chains. These were very harsh and dangerous travels as freedom riders. The Jews of this Mississippi town are not happy that I am here, wrote one Jewish activist. Too many of us civil rights workers are Jews, it seems. Back in Birmingham, Rabbi Grafman condemned the Freedom Riders for upsetting the balance between Jews and their white neighbors. Quote, he doesn't have to live with these people, Grafman explained, but we do and our people have got to live with them. When Martin Hinchin was asked whether Freedom Riders visited his town, Alexandria, Louisiana, he responded, no, thank goodness, explaining that the volunteers were adding salt to the wounds and not helping the situation one bit. Rabbi Perry Nussbaum of Jackson, Mississippi, visited Jewish freedom riders who were put in jail in that city. And for doing that, he was criticized by his congregants and also by his fellow rabbis of the South. They said he was violating the South's unwritten rules on issues of race and endangering the local Jewish community. Not only rabbis in the South, but rabbis in the North too were attacked sometimes by their congregations for their involvement in the civil rights movement. One example is Rabbi Walter Plout. He was a German Jewish refugee who served as a reform rabbi of a large congregation in Great Neck, New York. And there were, by the way, quite a few German Jewish refugee rabbis came to the United States and became very seriously heavily involved in the civil rights movement. One thing's immediately, of course, of Rabbi Joachim Prince and my father and so many others. But Rabbi Walter Plout joined a special convoy of clergy as freedom riders. There were seven white Protestants, seven black Protestants and four rabbis who went south in 1961. And Rabbi Plout wrote about his reason for doing this. I have witnessed at first hand the Holocaust of European Jewry. My immediate family was saved, but the rest of the far-flung family was murdered by the Nazis. I have learned that human suffering is indivisible. And therefore I have special sympathy for the plight of the Negroes in the South. His congregation was furious. The president of the synagogue sent him a telegram and he wrote the following. 
I understand you plan to leave on a so-called freedom ride early next week. Your action is ill-advised and I urge you not to go. There are four bar mitzvahs scheduled for next weekend. Rabbi Plout went anyway, but the result was a big split in his synagogue. And sadly, he died three years later of cancer at the young age of 44. But I want to turn now to the civil rights movement as a religious experience, because it was for so many of the participants. A very prominent civil rights lawyer named Jack Greenberg, a lawyer for the NAACP who worked on Brown versus Board of Education and the integration of the University of Mississippi and many other cases, a very distinguished lawyer, Jewish lawyer, described going to the Supreme Court for a case involving civil rights for the first time. And he said, it was like a religious experience. The first few times I was there, I was full of awe. I had an almost tactile feeling. The first time I was in the Supreme Court, I wasn't arguing. I felt as if I were in a synagogue and I reached to see whether or not I had a yarmulke on. I thought I ought to have one on. For my father, going to the march in Selma, Alabama in March of 1965 was also a religious experience. If you heard him on the film clip that was just shown, you know that he said that he felt it was a holy experience. He said it reminded him of walking with Hasidic Rebbe's in Europe. And he said that although they were marching, they were also singing. He said, I felt my legs were praying. My father first met Dr. King in 1963 at a conference in Chicago on religion and race. And they immediately became very close. They would go and give lectures together at various colleges and to organizations, Jewish organizations and others. When they first met, they were each keynote speakers at the conference in Chicago. My father quoted from the Bible. He opened his address by reminding people of the Exodus story. He reminded them that at the first civil rights conference, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. And he said that the outcome of that summit has not yet come to an end. Pharaoh is not yet willing to capitulate. And the way he spoke was to make it clear that in this story, the Jews were not only slaves in Egypt, but in this case, they were also the Pharaoh. My father quoted a verse from Deuteronomy 3019, where Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. My father interpreted that verse by saying that the aim of the conference on religion and race is first of all to state clearly the stark alternative. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have set before you religion and race, life and death, blessing and curse, choose life. Race, he said, is a denial of the existence of God. Now, I want to say a word about what happened in the, what some have called the broken alliance between blacks and Jews. There were some Jews who supported the principles of the civil rights movement, but felt that Jews should concern themselves instead with Jewish causes and not get involved in civil rights. The historian Michael Staub in his book, Torn at the Roots, has described some of this attitude and he has citations from thinkers such as Marie Serkin, Arthur Hertzberg, Abraham Duker, Leslie Fiedler, Richard Rubenstein, Lucy Davidovich, Emil Fackenheim, 
for example, Fackenheim condemned prophetic Judaism outright for its insistent pleas for social justice. Lucy Davidovich compared black nationalists to Nazis and warned that they were anti-Semitic like Russian peasants, quote, like the Russian serfs in many respects, these poor Negro masses share with them also a primitive religiosity embedded in superstition and a distrust of urban mercantile society and of a money economy. This extended to a book by Hillel Halkin some years later, arguing that Jews should move to Israel and concern themselves with Jewish causes and Jewish people. There were white liberals, and I think here of Paul Weiss, professor of philosophy at Yale University, who appeared on national television with James Baldwin and said to him, why can't you blacks be more like Jews? And this of course is the dangerous assumption and error and falsehood the Jews somehow pulled themselves up on their own, ignoring utterly the kind of legal and federal assistance they received from being classified as white. And to read more about this, I would turn to Karen Brodkin's book, How the Jews Became White Folks. Black frustration, exhaustion, and anger also led to resentment against white involvement in the civil rights movement. The Black Panthers were highly intellectual, sophisticated in political theory and in critical race theory. To them, the struggle should be a Black movement against systemic racism and a Black effort at self-protection and social care within the Black community. So they established, for example, daycare, kindergartens, food banks, neighborhood guards. The attacks on them on the Black Panthers and the press by the FBI, the killing of the leadership actually demonstrated the truth of their arguments about racism in America. Mark Dollinger has pointed out that actually Black nationalism helped to reinforce Jewish nationalism, especially after 1967. And that Black studies at universities inspired Jewish studies. My colleague Shaul Magin in his forthcoming book demonstrates how the Black Panthers also inspired Mayor Kahana and the Jewish Defense League. But I want to return to my earlier theme of Judeo innocence in connection with the alleged breakdown of the alliance that people place in the 1970s. In his book, What Went Wrong? Murray Friedman inaugurated an argument that has become all too prevalent. That blacks, he says, basically threw Jews out of the civil rights movement. It's a theme that incidentally echoes a bit uh, with an old Christian notion that in antiquity, shortly after the death of Jesus, it was Jews who threw Christians out of the synagogue. And that's what led to the construction of the new religion, Christianity. Otherwise there would have been peace and reconciliation, which of course we know is nonsense. But Murray Friedman's argument places no responsibility on Jews other than to note that the American Jewish community became increasingly right wing in the era of President Nixon and then President Reagan. It was of course Jewish opposition to affirmative action, which is something that uh, of course was terribly painful for African Americans and also for Jewish women because affirmative action, as you know, also affected Jewish women, something that Jewish organizations never seem to consider. And there were Jewish demands, for example, that Andrew Young in the 1970s, one of the greatest friends of the Jewish people, that Andrew Young be forced out of his role as US ambassador to the United Nations because he had privately met at the request of President Jimmy Carter with a Palestinian leader. And then came the refusal the Jewish community to accept the apology of Jesse Jackson, who had made an inappropriate comment regarding Jews in New York City. Jesse Jackson was boycotted by American Jewish organizations and that in turn opened the door to Louis Farrakhan, a demagogue who was responsible for the worst and most long lasting anti-Semitic rhetoric the United States has ever seen. He is dangerous and intimidating to African-Americans as well for his incendiary statements about Malcolm X that created a climate of vilification 
that may well have inspired the assassination of Malcolm X, as Farrakhan himself has admitted. So he is an intimidating figure in many respects. But what about the motivations for the civil rights movement and Jewish involvement? There were several. First, there was a sense that Jews had arrived in the United States. To be involved in civil rights meant the Jews were fully American and middle class, because after all, poor people generally do not march and protest or have the resources to go to the South and take part. It was also in that time, America, there was a sense that it was a cultural era of liberation. The gradually quotas on Jewish students were eroding. The women's movement was beginning. And there was a mood in the United States of being a great superpower and also the most moral and free country on earth, a country that could accomplish anything. And that was inspiring. But the civil rights movement could also be used in some sense by Jews as a kind of blackface that Michael Rogan has written about in his book, that is putting on black makeup or spending time with black people could also be a way for Jews to emphasize their whiteness. On the other hand, it was also a way to demonstrate alliance, sympathy. There were political reasons as well. Jewish leaders never tired of explaining that a society that protects African-Americans from arbitrary violations of civil rights also guaranteed the sanctity of Jewish rights. The head of the Cincinnati Jewish Community Relations Council once explained, quote, the society in which Jews are most secure is itself secure, but only to the extent that citizens of all races and creeds enjoy full equality. And then there was the motivation of the Holocaust itself. Rabbi Joachim Prince at the March in Washington in 1963 said, that it is because of the Holocaust that I have to speak out. And yet there were others who said, because of the Holocaust, I have to worry only about Jews. In some sense, the Jews stood at a crossroads at the time, either never again to anyone or never again to Jews. Which path do we take? In some sense also, Jews were marching because they wanted to demonstrate what they thought German Christians should have done in the Nazi period, but didn't. There were liberal efforts. When the Miami synagogue was bombed in March of 1958, the American Jewish Congress decided to convene its national convention in Miami in May, and they invited Dr. Martin Luther King to speak it was in fact the first time that he spoke to an integrated audience. Dr. King at that meeting spoke about the Holocaust, about black soldiers in the US Army who were fighting against Hitler. And he spoke about Jews and blacks being joint targets in the South. More than anyone else, it was Dr. King who created the alliances and the friendships that he himself felt were necessary and that I think came to us as an enormous gift. There were also existential Jewish reasons for involvement in the civil rights movement. There was a sense, especially among some young people, but not only, a sense that Judaism had become something superficial with rituals and ceremonies that lacked passion, that didn't seem to have a deeper meaning or an emotional engagement. Think about the theologians of the era, about Paul Tillich, the Protestant, who said that God is the ground of being, or Mordechai Kaplan, a Jewish thinker, who spoke about God as the power that makes for salvation. Both lack the inspiring, commanding voice of Sinai. They fail to resonate with the prophetic tradition that demands justice. My father leads us to the question of what we contribute as religious Jews to discussions about racism. My father had published an important book on the Hebrew prophets in which he emphasized the pathos of God, that God 
feels what we are suffering. He spoke about responsibility that's insisted upon by the prophetic tradition and about repentance that's necessary. He says there, for example, that people who say that the prophets were hysterical for screaming about injustice, if we call the prophets hysterical, what do we, what do we call people who are utterly indifferent to suffering? My father talked about the personal, the personal commitment that comes with being a religious Jew. He says, how can I worship God when my government in my name is committing crimes, beating and killing black citizens who simply want the basic rights of voting, education, decent housing, a living wage. What my father combines is the prophetic tradition of insistence, insistence on justice with a Hasidic tradition of compassion. And it was out of that combination that my father founded an organization called Clergy and Laymen Concerned About Vietnam in 1965. And it was under the auspices of that organization that Dr. King decided to speak out against the war in Vietnam, which he did on April 4th, 1967 at Riverside Church in New York. And I was there that night, it was extraordinary. It was a meeting a gathering that was organized by Richard Fernandez, the executive director of this organization, Clergy and Layman Concerned About Vietnam. When Dr. King spoke, he talked about the war in part as a terrible self-destruction on the part of the United States and his effort to stop it also as a way to try to save the soul of America, which was in fact the motto of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But he also recognized that the war in Vietnam was a race issue because it was in many ways a racial war. Dr. King said, we are taking black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they haven't found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. My father at that meeting also spoke and he said, it is our duty as citizens to say no to the subversiveness of our government, which is ruining the values that we cherish. Has our conscience become a fossil? Is all mercy gone? If mercy, the mother of humility, is still alive as a demand, how can we say yes to our bringing agony to a tormented country? We are here because our own integrity as human beings is decaying in the agony and merciless killing done in our name. In a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. What had become apparent was that the United States had lost any possibility of military or political aims that were being achieved in Vietnam, and that we had instead become, turned this into a war of war crimes dropping napalm on innocent civilians, burning them alive. But I want to conclude by talking a bit about more recent discussions of race and racism that are taking place in multiple new ways. I wanna speak briefly about uh, some of the ways in which racism is understood as linked to Jews and Judaism or ways it could be. So studies by Jake Cameron Carter, by Ted Weil, among others, link the invention of race to views of Jews and Judaism in Europe. Carter sees race thinking emerging from Christianity's effort to overcome Judaism. And that he says, binds the racial imagination. He writes that race is the discourse that constitutes whiteness in relationship to a non-Jewish alien without and a Jewish alien within the body politic. Stuart Hall, among others, has defined race as a floating signifier that changes from one society and culture and era to another. And critical race theory understands whiteness to function as a property, as something that has to be protected and defended, and yet not seen as such. 
More recent scholars have argued that the issue is not a generic race or racism, but rather a widespread ideology of anti-Blackness. Anti-Black violence, argues the American philosopher Frank Wilderson, anti-Black violence has become necessary for the society to have an enemy within. Andrew Prevost and others ask, what is the impact of racism on the soul of Black people? Denying subjectivity to Blacks and rendering Black lives simply instrumentalized results in a social death that leads Wilderson to a state of despair, an existential state that cannot be overcome, what he calls Afro-pessimism. Prevost, by contrast, draws on medieval Catholic mystical traditions as resources to heal the Black soul from this pessimism. In his recent book, The Black Register, the South African philosopher Tendai Sidhole argues that Blackness is actually the non-human. It is the life that is not life. While racism claims to hate the bodies of Black people, Racists actually hate the very existence of Black people and deny that they possess life. Sitholi points to the Americana massacre in South Africa in 2012, when Black miners who were on strike demanding a living wage and basic human decency were simply shot to death by police. The miners, he points out, in this case, what the police were seeing, they were seeing minors who do not possess life. They can't possess life in a racist society. So their killing is not even death. What do we conclude from the police killings in the United States of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, George Floyd, and so many other black men, women, children, and also from the Americana massacre? The language of rights and citizenship is not working. The very governments that are supposed to uphold human rights are the ones that are violating human rights. But is there something positive on the horizon? I want to conclude by mentioning the recuperation by black theologians of Jewish traditions on the Exodus and the prophets that I see leading today to a new phase in relations between the two communities and also for Black Jews. I quote from Keith McGee, who writes of the kinship of strangers who have both known Egypt, consideration of the experiences that link Black and Jewish Americans. Historians and political scientists are also joining theologians in returning to the prophetic traditions when they address race and anti-blackness in the United States. I think of Cornell West and Kathleen Caveney, of George Shulman, David Blight, and Keith McGee, and Al Rabito, and so many others. Esau Macaulay's book, Reading While Black, addresses the affective dimensions of the impact of racism. From rage to hope, the impact of racism can be given a voice through the words of the Bible. He writes, quote, I argue that Israel's pain and anger as recorded in the prophets and in the book of Psalms provide a means of processing black grief. The cross, he writes, functions as the end of the cycle of vengeance and death. And the cross is a place where God enters into our pain. For my father, it is with the prophets that God enters into our pain. Macaulay draws on the work of James Cone, who argued that God's choice of enslaved Israel to be his chosen people speaks to God's own character. Cone writes, quote, if God had chosen as his holy nation, the Egyptian slave masters instead of the Israelite slaves, a completely different kind of God would have been revealed. And so an interpretation of the Bible that tries to justify racism violates what we know of God's character. 
Let me finally return to my father. The danger of racism, he writes, is that it begins as a mere thought and extends to become a way of thinking, a highway of insolence, as well as a standard of values, overriding truth, justice, and beauty. Racism, he writes, racism is Satanism, unmitigated evil. Few of us seem to realize how insidious, how radical, how universal and evil racism is. Few of us realize that racism is man's gravest threat to man, a maximum of hatred for a minimum of reason, the maximum of cruelty for a minimum of thinking. Yes, Pharaoh is not yet ready to capitulate, but my father also warns us, we forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate, to degrade, to deny basic rights. We, all of us in this society. My father would certainly agree with Jesse Jackson who said in a forthcoming interview, the best of Judaism is the fight against racism. And Andrew Young, one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement who said, we adopted the Old Testament story as our story. And that my father's presence, and I'm sure he means all Jews who were present, was a spiritual authority. Young says, we had read his book on the prophets, but on this occasion in Selma, he was the prophet like somebody who had just walked out of the Hebrew Bible. The inspiration was and continues to be extraordinary and I hope will sustain us even as we recognize the depth of the problem of anti-blackness and how much there is for us to yet accomplish. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Susanna. I think on behalf of all the audience that cannot applaud in this constellation, I would like to thank you uh, for the very differentiated image of the historical um, and social reasons that made Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement so um, multifaceted with so many tensions also that you describe um, and ambivalent. But also, especially I wanted to thank you for pointing us to this element into this phenomenon of the religious experience of those involved in, in the civil rights movement, uh, for which your father is such, an, uh, such a wonderful example. And if I may take the, the privilege of the first question before we open the discussion, is actually exactly that what I wanted to ask you. Because I was intrigued by the contrast you made uh, between uh, two, for example, of the post-Holocaust uh, philosophers, such as uh, Emil Fackenheim, and you also mentioned Richard Rubenstein, and your father, who is of the same generation, um, and who are all thinking about the, the Jewish experience in Europe. And I was wondering if you have an explanation why they come to so different conclusions, because I, I certainly understand the conclusion of Emil Fackenheim to who put the concern about the fate of the Jewish people in the present at, at the center. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I wanted to ask whether it is something specific in your father's thought, the biblical thinking, the Hasidic thinking, that made him make this decision uh, and something that is dis distinctive from, from the other two? Thank you, that's a great question. And it's something that uh, we should continue to talk about because I don't think there is a simple answer to it. But I would say that what was, uh, what I, uh, the prophetic tradition was certainly very important for German Jews. So they brought that tradition with them to the United States. And we see how many German Jewish refugee rabbis became involved, actively involved. Um, and, and not only of course, German Jews, but American as well. And the American, also the American Jewish tradition was heavily imbued with prophetic, the prophetic spirit. I do think that the level of experience though is something different. 
that is, I think in the German Jewish tradition and the, the apex would be Hermann Cohen, uh, has to do with the principles of justice, the principles of the prophets, which are very important. But I think what my father brought was also the Hasidic spirit, the spirit and also the emphasis that comes with it on compassion, on empathy. So the empathy that human beings have for one another or should have, but also the, the empathy of God for us and also what it means to be a Hasidic Rebbe as opposed to let's say a reform rabbi. That is the way a Rebbe takes on in himself the feelings, the religious doubts or the sins of his followers, the way the Rebbe descends to the level of despair when someone comes with terrible problems and troubles. Uh, there is an emphasis over and over on compassion. The question would be, does this translate from compassion for other Jews to compassion for people who are not Jewish? I can well understand perhaps why some refugees from Europe or some Jews after the Shoah would find it very hard to feel any concern for the Gentile world. On the other hand, Americans and certainly African Americans were not in Nazi Germany, they fought against it. So why would there be Jews who would not express the gratitude? And then I just say finally about that one word. One of the things I find extraordinary is that the leaders of the civil rights movement, and you saw some of the pictures, John Lewis and C.T. Vivian and Andrew Young and so many others, Clarence Jones, when I meet them and I, I do, I'm invited to speak with them and so on, they embrace me, they hug me because they love my father and they're grateful to this day. So many years later, they're grateful. And the question is why? Well, gratitude of course is a religious, a religious component, is a religious expression, but also the leaders of the civil rights movement were trained in nonviolence. And nonviolence doesn't just mean not fighting back when someone hits you. It's a training of the heart, the soul, the mind. It's a different way of thinking, a different way of constructing oneself. And that involves expressing gratitude. And I, I find that an important lesson for me on, the, on a moral and religious level, their expression of gratitude for my father. And I think it's important for us as Jews to express our gratitude for the civil rights movement for giving us this opportunity to march, to express our Judaism, to feel inspired and to have a religious experience, whether in the Supreme Court or at Selma. Thank you. <laughs> and I would just like to remind uh, the audience that now you can uh, indicate that you would like to pose questions in the chat and Stefan Vogt will kind of uh, uh, take her questions from there. There's one first question. The problem is that I cannot really see the name. Maybe please write your name into the chat so I can properly call you up. There is a question by someone with the uh, name Johan at the beginning, but the rest of the name is not visible, unfortunately. You want to Yes. So I have to. Yes, yes, I think I should be probably. Can you hear me? Does the microphone work? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much for your lecture. I thought this was a wonderful overview, not just an overview, but actually a very subtle account. And what I would like to ask you is whether you see any type of um, difference uh, between the civil rights movement that you focused on and between the Black Lives Matter movement, which is sometimes called a new civil rights movement. Um, do you think that the basis of a of an alliance, of a solidarity between Jewish Americans and African Americans has changed, uh, particularly with respect to the movement that, the intellectual movement that you refer to, Afro-pessimism, which perhaps creates new obstacles or new challenges perhaps rather for 
for the alliance that were that you described with regard to the older civil rights movement? Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Uh, it's a very different movement, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it's a movement that doesn't have the kind of formal leadership structure that the civil rights movement had. Uh, it's much more loosely developed with a sense that one should simply join. There shouldn't be one particular spokesperson. And this may be in part because it's a movement that was organized initially by women uh, who didn't want to have a hierarchical structure. Um, and it's very open and embracing of people. It's also quite extraordinary to see how many people, how many people, especially younger generation, go out in the streets and march and protest. I think that was an extraordinary moment for us to recognize what, what was developing in the conscience of the United States and young people. It's not a movement that's uh, particularly religious the way the civil rights movement was religious, speaking from the Bible. In terms of the Afro-pessimism, I actually think that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is facing some truly horrific, horrific events, specific events in the United States, but also a revival of, of white nationalism in this country and a dangerous white nationalism with militias that now have automatic weapons and that I hold meetings once a month to practice uh, in many states in the United States. I'm not sure we know exactly how many there are, but they're intimidating. We saw it in Lansing, Michigan, for example, uh, when these people with their machine guns gathered outside the, the state house uh, to threaten the governor. So um, the, the problems faced today in the United States in some way feel more dangerous in part because of the weapons. Uh, uh, and yet there is on the other hand, something that's not pessimistic, which is the thousands of people marching in the streets under the auspices of Black Lives Matter. So uh, I actually feel more optimistic now than I did, let's say 10 or 15 years ago. And I would say that a lot of Jewish young people are involved including Jewish organizations, uh, ad hoc groups that have sprung up that are profoundly concerned about the racism that informs also the treatment of asylum seekers and immigrants and Muslims and Sikhs and the recognition that those who burn down black churches in the South and walked into the church in South Carolina and Charleston and Dylan Roof shot people at Bible study, that that's intimately connected to the shooting in the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue or in Poway, California. Uh, those who hate African-Americans also hate Jews, white and black. So the need for alliance is very, very great. Please come forward with your questions or comments and please write your names into the chat so I can call you up in the order that you're. In the meantime, maybe I can ask a follow-up question to the last one and to what you said, because when, when you observe it from Europe, um, you look at what's written in Facebook, uh, you read articles uh, about the Black Matters uh, uh, movement, Black, Black Lives Matters movement, then for me, it's not clear whether there's already some sort of institutional solidarity between Jewish groups and, and the movement. Um, is the Jewish community, which doesn't exist because it is multi-voiced, uh, uh, are there uh, interactions between, between those movements? Uh, are there split voices, uh, voices also against uh, the Black Lives Matters movement? So what's the discussion right now? Can you give us an impression of what is going on? So the crucial line of division concerns Israel, its government, and its policies, especially vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians, uh, and concerns that Black Lives Matter is anti-Israel, 
the initial platform that was published I contained something like um, a thousand of pages and one little paragraph about Israel. But yet that was taken out and people said it can't cooperate then. Jews wouldn't cooperate. But uh, that's also been modified and changed. That's not the concern right now. But certainly alliances uh, between Jewish organizations and Black Lives Matter can turn and fall on the question of Israel and whether one uh, should criticize Israel and government policies, be concerned, express concern, and what kind of language. Uh, and of course, the BDS movement is uh, highly controversial. So those really are the issues, but they're also dividing the Jewish community internally. And uh, it's become actually quite tense in many respects, how one feels about Israel and Israeli politics, and it has affected Jewish organizations and synagogues as well. So I hope very much that this moment can be resolved in a, in a good way. I think it has sometimes led to Jewish uh, prejudice that African-Americans sort of automatically or by definition somehow are anti-Israel. And uh, I don't see that the case. I think those also who are concerned about Palestinians uh, and their lives and their rights uh, aren't necessarily opposed to the state of Israel because the state of Israel at least should have that concern as well since they are also uh, under uh, either citizens of Israel or under government uh, occupation. So that really is uh, the, uh, the dividing line right now, internally within the Jewish community and between Jews and everyone else. <laughs> That's something that needs to be addressed. I have Malte Nielsen on the list. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for this um, lecture, which was really, really informative and um, moving. And I was wondering, because um, on the one hand, you um, empathized um, the, the human movement, the connection, the empathy part. But I was also wondering how, um, a very practical question maybe, how you navigate religious differences in the practical, in, um, yeah, in the religious sense, how you navigate those differences. That would be my question. Oh, what an interesting question. Uh, so, um, I, first of all, I was raised uh, to feel comfortable and at home in any denomination of Judaism, whether it was Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Hasidic, to feel at home. And I think that's very important. And also to have respect for religious people of other faiths and to try to find some way in which we can connect, even if we don't agree on certain ideas or theologically, but nonetheless, in terms of religiosity, there's something about certain black churches that feel to me somehow more moving, more important religiously than some white churches and some synagogues. My father used to say that if there's any hope for the future of Judaism in America, it lies with the black church because he found there a religious expression that reminded him of the little Hasidic shtibbles in Eastern Europe that he had grown up in. I will tell you that just earlier this morning, I was attending via Zoom, the Society of Biblical Literature, a panel that was looking at biblical studies and race and the connection to anti-Judaism. And I thought that was quite extraordinary. Uh, first, that more and more we're recognizing that we're linked, that attitudes toward African-Americans uh, are linked to certain theological constructs and assumptions. And those need to be examined carefully and if need be demolished so that we understand that attitudes 
Christians may have uh, toward Judaism may lead to certain racist presuppositions. And I think in Judaism, we need to do something similar. We need to be more attentive to certain racist ideas that exist within Judaism that may be concealed or may be explicit, but that also deserves our attention. How do we think about people of color, black people? How do we think about Gentiles in Judaism? And that of course is also linked to the way Jewish men think about women and think about people who are non-binary sexually and in gender terms. So I actually think something very interesting is on the horizon right now. I think it's a great time to be involved in the field, <clears throat> excuse me, in the field of theology and in the study of religion. I think it's an exciting time and a really wonderful time for young people to go into the field, to get a PhD and enter this field. Things are changing in great ways. The next would be Elisa Klapek. Um, uh, do you want me to read out your question or would you like to pose it yourself? Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Hello, Susanna. Hi. Elisa, Hi. listening to you, it's gorgeous to see you. <laughs> Great to see so, you. <laughs> so what do you say about the film Zelma, which omitted your father and other rabbis? There were no rabbis in the iconic picture um, on, on the bridge. And did you speak with Oprah Winfrey about it? She was the producer. What did she say about that? <laughs> uh, so I, I have not spoken to her. I don't know her. I did write an article about it and I was very disappointed. I was disappointed also because, <laughs> I, yeah, it, it, it changed. there were certain historical problems with that film as we know, the way it depicted President Lyndon B. Johnson, for example, which is wrong, he was supportive of civil rights efforts, more so than the presidents before and after. And so to depict him as being hostile, but why, why do that? You know, sometimes the historical reality is actually much more interesting than what anyone could come up with in fiction. But yes, this omission of my father and uh, the presence, the Jewish presence, Why would someone do that? And I have to tell you that some years ago, I went to Selma. I've been there actually several times, but many years ago, my first trip, I went to the home of Dr. and Mrs. Sullivan Jackson. Dr. Jackson was an African-American dentist and Dr. King lived in that home for several months during the Selma campaign in 64, 65. And they've, their daughter, Joanna Jackson, has preserved the home, the furniture, you can see the bed, that Dr. King slept in and the telephone that he used to speak to President Johnson. It's really quite special. And I urge everybody to go and visit that place. It's a very special place to visit. It's a very meaningful experience. But when Mrs. Jackson told us about that weekend and my father stayed overnight at her home, she said that in the morning, she got out of the bedroom and went into the living room And she saw Dr. King in one side of the room saying his morning prayers. And my father was in the other side of the living room saying his morning prayers. And there were a couple of other black pastors in the, in the dining area praying. And how extraordinary that was, that moment for her. And I thought, you know, that would have been so great to have in the film to show that the civil rights movement was also an ecumenical movement. You know, Dr. King quoted from Moses, from Amos and Isaiah, all the time in his public speeches, his main public speeches don't mention Jesus or quote from the gospels or Paul. That's very striking. He did, of course, when he preached in church, but his public speeches were really quoting from the Hebrew Bible to bring us in together, to bring Jews in with him. And to omit that is to ignore a central dimension of the civil rights movement and what it meant for us, for us as Jews, for Americans and for African Americans. So I, yes, I was terribly disappointed with that depiction in the film. I don't understand it. Why did that happen? What a tragic omission. So thank you for your question. <laughs> 
have a request for a uh, Nachfrage. Ah, Elisa Klappig again, please. Nee, das, uh, this was uh, just as I tried, uh, um, I understood that I wrote it into the wrong chat, my, my question. Uh -huh. okay. It's okay. I can, I can suggest a question that someone could ask me. Uh, or I could ask the, uh, the Germans in the audience about the reception of some of the critical race theory that's written in the United States, how much it has come to Germany. Uh, my impression, and I may be wrong, my impression is that figures who are well known here, such as Cornell West, are not so well known in Germany. And I think it's a pity because these are issues that we could discuss together in a useful way. And I think the German reception of critical American critical race theory, American writings on, on racism, the way that would be received in Germany could actually be very helpful to us in the United States. Christian, please. Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful suggestion. I mean, it, it's difficult to tell actually. Cornel West, certainly, yes. I don't know how broadly in society the name is known, but certainly uh, in scholarly uh, uh, circles. I don't know about, about others. Maybe my colleague Johannes Fultz can say more about it from an American studies perspective. But uh, to take your question, because I was uh, intrigued by your, uh, by your conclusion where you expressed also some hopeful um, expect, expectations for the future. Uh, and you pointed especially to black theologians and their interest in, in Jewish traditions. And I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about how that works. Uh, who are they and, and uh, how do they uh, embrace these traditions and interpret them from their Christian point of view? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question. And it's actually, <laughs> Uh, it's funny that I'm, I'm here as somebody in Jewish studies talking about Christian theology, but you and I do that often, don't we? So um, I, I think for one thing, it's a younger generation. Uh, for another, it's um, coming from theologians who are seeing so much in the prophetic writings that, uh, that's meaningful. The, the, there is, you know, the tragedy in Germany uh, it was that Protestant theologians fell into a kind of neo-Marcionism and were not able to or didn't want to make the Hebrew prophets central to their theological writings uh, and defined them as ecstatics. Uh, and even in Ernst Trulch's lecture in December 1915, you mock them as essentially country bumpkins who didn't understand how the world works, uh, came from rural, little rural areas. So there's an absence of the prophetic tradition in Germany, but in the United States, it's very different. It's different in the white Protestant tradition and also in the black church. And that I think has had a tremendous impact in the way the United States is... Uh, understands itself and understands also that it has a, a mission of justice. Now, of course, that kind of mission can sometimes take the United States in, uh, in directions that are aggressive and militaristic. Uh, but the importance of the prophetic tradition uh, in the U.S. can't be overstated. And it then comes together with this long Jewish tradition from the 19th century, not that long really, but the 19th century. I, I just, you know, um, I just want to say that one of the things, it, one of the things I want to mention in this connection is that my father brought certain Hasidic ideas to in some way temper or apply the prophetic tradition with understandings of compassion and a different understanding of what it means to be a rabbi or a leader. But it's also the prophetic tradition that 
influenced and changed his understanding of Hasidic Judaism. In this respect, Hasidic Judaism, and this stems out of medieval Kabbalistic understandings, the emphasis there is that when you do a religious deed, such as before you pray, before you say a blessing, you do it with the direction in your mind of trying to unify God, trying to give strength to God. But the focus is always on what we would call the religious commandments, uh, such as prayer and blessings. But what my father did was to take the prophetic tradition of justice and how we treat one another and bring it into Hasidism by saying that it's not only the religious commandments that bring strength to God and redemption to God, but it's also the commandments that have to do with how we treat other human beings. And that's an expanded, let's say, an expansion of Hasidic understanding. So that I think is a, a crucial element. So that when he spoke out on behalf of African-Americans and against racism, that in itself was religious for him. Religious, I mean, Hasidic religious, but also an extension of classical traditional Hasidic theology in a very new direction. And that too is, is important and it's something very innovative in the history of Jewish theology. Thank you. <clears throat> Please. Yes, uh, so I just wanted to come back to your question about um, the presence of um, critical race theorists and whether they are known in, in Germany or not, particularly Cornel West. Uh, as it happens, one of the most recent books by Cornel West, uh, Black Prophetic Fire, Yes. is actually yes, co-written with Christa Buschendorf. And Christa Buschendorf is a retired American studies professor here at Goethe University. And as a matter of fact, she's my predecessor. Ah. Um, so that is a book of conversations that they did together about um, leading African-American intellectuals going back to the 19th century and Frederick Douglass. Um, and also uh, just to perhaps add one more little thing, uh, Frank Wilderson, as a, as a name that you mentioned in connection with um, Afro-pessimism, his um, book, Afro-pessimism, has actually just been released this summer in German by a very prestigious press here and has gotten wide newspaper coverage. So, yes, there is actually uh -huh. quite a bit of discussion about um, the household names of critical race theory, both inside of academia and in the larger reading public. Oh, that's wonderful to know. Thank you so much for telling me. And Krista Buschendorf, I know that book. I've read that book. And, and she actually visited us at Dartmouth one summer. So I know her and, and, and her husband. And I, yes, and I realized that she had been at Goethe University, of course. Um, I suppose one of the questions would be uh, whether there is a particular perspective from German history and uh, German understandings of race and anti-Semitism and how that would compare to the analyses in the United States. Is, is German, for example, is German antisemitism a species of racism or is it a distinct, something distinct as a phenomenon with some overlap perhaps, but nonetheless something separate. These are the kinds of discussions that would be interesting to hear uh, as, as the uh, American critical race theory is, uh, is explored. I, mean, I can just tell you for, uh, from my own work, when I think about antisemitism or when I read the scholarship, it tends to be about what people said. So many statements, bad things about Jews. But when I look at scholarship on racism directed against African Americans, I see that there are other dimensions that are brought out. So for example, the impact of racism, the impact of slavery, the intergenerational transmission of it, but also what the emotional and affective dimensions were and are. Saija Hartman, for example, who talks about slavery as the erotics of terror. What is, the, what is that, how does that translate once slavery comes to an end? That erotics of terror doesn't simply go away. It lingers and needs to be applied somewhere and somehow. And how is that expressed? That needs to be explored. Why do people 
take pleasure in brutalizing and torturing other people? What does it do to you to even hear somebody being tortured? We think more in the US and we think about slavery, we think immediately of rape because rape is part of slavery and slavery enables rape. I recently read a book about pogroms against Jews and in the introduction, there's a sentence that says, and thousands of women were raped, period. And that's it. Without considering the impact, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to the woman? Because to be raped is not the same as having your, your arm broken, let's say. It's an assault against the body and it's an assault against the soul. And it has long-term consequences. It can be venereal disease, it can be pregnancy. What does it do to the woman in terms of her family and her sense of self? That is something that one carries in her life forever to have been raped. And so there are dimensions that need to be brought into the study of antisemitism that we can learn about from the way racism is studied in the United States. And that would be a helpful conversation to have. There is a question by Malte N. Maybe Malte N, please, uh, can you just ask questions out loud, please? Uh, uh, yes, it was um, on your um, on your uh, uh, question. Um, so um, I would say that in Germany, um, there's um, a text by Vasi Apo who says that Germany just started um, working on racism and its own colonial history in 2015. So um, I think it's a kind of new topic in Germany because we just get used to the idea of even being colon colonizers <laughs> and having a history of racism. So um, I would um, argue in that direction that it's with Black Lives Matter, this conversation is like starting in Germany, but kind of maybe linked to Spain and um, the being thrown out of Spain of Jews in 1492 and linked to that Reconquista and the Inquisition, that it's linked somewhere there with anti-Semitism and racism, that there's a link. And I would argue that in Germany, from a broader perspective, even today, it's more like an American problem. Racism is an American problem, maybe a French problem because they had colonies, but Germany is kind of struggling to acknowledge, yes, we were colonizers. I would say we are changing in the moment and there is knowledge getting through. Uh, for example, um, I was surprised that we read a text by Franz Fanon, uh, White Faces, Black Masks, which is kind of the first text I read in my study, I'm a student, um, an academic context which is not written so um, like yeah it's written by a person of color and that, uh, and that was the first uh, the first work you had read by a person of color in your studies yeah that's remarkable well thank you well you, you raised a huge number of, of very important issues uh, I, I would begin by saying that uh, I, I agree with what you say that Germany has not yet dealt with its own a history of colonialism. And that was true when I saw an exhibit a few years ago in Berlin at the German Historical Museum on colonialism. It was highly inadequate. Uh, you know, sometimes it helps to read the history of your own country written by somebody from outside. So if you were to look at a history, for example, the history of Jews in Poland or history of Poland, you would see immediately that during the partitions of Poland in the 1770s, when Poland was divided between uh, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, that actually Poland views its own history of that period as the beginning of its colonization. So that in fact, one would speak then that Prussia began its colonial history in the 1770s by colonizing a chunk of Poland. And of course the issue, the, the, the perceived need at the time was to Germanize the Poles, but not to be Polonized by them. And one sees just as we see, for example, there are so many studies of the 19th century British novel and the echoes of British colonialism in those novels. So too, we see in that 
Prussian colonization of Poland echoes in German literature and even in German historiography and theology. There's an American scholar whose name I don't recall at the moment, wrote a wonderful book called Germany's Wild East uh, that looks exactly at this, how Germany viewed its colonization, its colonized peoples in Poland in its literary tradition. Of course, you probably immediately would think as I do of the novel Zoll und Haben, uh, Freitag's novel, which is somewhat later. But uh, so to begin with that, we see that Germany had uh, already uh, certain colonial politics that did involve attitudes, not only toward Jews, but toward Slavs, toward Poles, uh, that yeah, also uh, at the same time, was, Germany was undergoing this long process of emancipating the Jews, uh, a process that involved lots of different laws and regulations in the different German principalities is what Samir Esmir is called in a different context, a juridical humanity. So your humanity itself is devised and limited and defined by a set of legal principles arbitrarily imposed from outside, not by you. Uh, so during this process of emancipation, Jewishness had to be defined and redefined both by Jews and by non-Jews in Germany. Uh, and the Polish question comes to give it a certain kind of configuration, a colonial configuration. Now, that's just one aspect of Germany's colonial history um, that, that isn't taken sufficiently into consideration. Uh, I do see echoes of it in, um, in the German theological tradition, but I also wanted to say that what, what is so great among the many great things about Franz Fanon is his understanding of how colonialism affects people inside, in their heart and soul, in mind, in their sense of self, how you feel about yourself as a human being and your position in the world vis-a-vis -vis other people, but also in relation to larger society. And Fanon calls our attention to that because too often colonialism is left to the political scientists who may not explore the deeper recesses. And that's where I think theology comes in to understand that there are other dimensions to what it is to be a person, dimensions beyond the economic and the political, and that also need to be given voice in a way that I think uh, actually the Bible does a good job. I think of Psalm 137, which is a kind of anthem also in the African-American community for what it means to be taken by another country. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for those comments. I appreciate it. I, it would be so nice if we could go to the Cafe Albatross and sit around the table and have coffee and talk about all these things as I used to do when I was living in Frankfurt many years ago. Uh, those, I don't know if that cafe still exists, uh, but, uh, but those are very wonderful memories for me. Well, if there's no further question, we are also approaching eight o'clock here in Frankfurt. Uh, so I would really like to thank you. I mean, it, it would, as you said, it, it's, it's kind of sad that we are not together in a room and that <laughs> you cannot look into the faces of your audience uh, and the interaction is so distant in a way. Uh, but all the more, I would really like to thank you for the way you talk to us, for, the, for your presentation and the, uh, the differentiated image you gave us and also for the way of responding to our questions. Um, I think that um, my hope for the future is that at some point you will be able to travel again and to come to Frankfurt. Uh, yeah and uh, we to the United States, of course. And uh, so for the Buba lecture, which has had now an extraordinary form, I can only say next year in Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope. Uh, let's hope that in the next fall that's possible. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and hosting me. Thank you for all the efforts that you made with this incredible technology. And I hope that we will be together as a reunion very soon and meanwhile i hope everybody stays safe be well you too bye 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 <laughs>